No more demo shaming. This tutorial's combined length is already 28 minutes, and our character can do three things. Other tutorials have at least jump and camera by now if not ended. Today we are going to outrun those hairs on our tortoise. This 28 minutes gave us a foundation to build our system on, and it will pay off. This is our controller functional by the end of the episode. Three jumps, three strikes, and a camera. Sit back and enjoy, you could check the code later. First half of the video is dedicated to creation of a good jumping action. Aim to always solve the hardest task first. For me, the hardest thing is to get good assets, especially animations. For my jump idea, I used two full jump cycles animation from Mixama. The jump in place I butchered and cut into jump start, landing and three frames meter state that I stretch and cycle to get this focus position tremor. Then I added sprinting jump cycle that I also divided into jumping up and landing into sprint. The first trouble we encounter after creating jump run move is how do we supposed to wait till tense? We need a way to know for how long our state is active. It will benefit all states, so let's modify the base class. When switching, we will mark the time of state activation, and then we can just take the difference between that mark and the current moment. I also created a bunch of syntactic sugar functions to narrate my code better. Now meet our workflow formula. Step 1. Heavily rely on ability to know what time is it. Step 2. Have skeletal animation to base our internal timings on. Our transition logic consists of waiting till the animation end and then switching to midair. Check animations end in the skeleton, then write it down and check relevance. Now, when updating, we want to give our character some impulse. I didn't think too much about it and just slapped a flat vertical velocity. Midair is an interesting beast. It doesn't linger for a fixed time. Ideally, it wants to linger for the exact amount we need to fly and then to nicely transition to landing. Lazy solution is to check it with is on floor, but is on floor has no flexibility, is dependent on your character collider, and won't work if your landing animations start when your is on floor is still false. The more universal solution is to know the exact height from the floor at any given time. The shortest way I can think of is to have a ray casted from our root bone downwards. Bone attachment is out of the picture because it copies the rotation of the bone and we want only position, so just follow it with a script. Also, visual debugging tools are helping immensely, so create two spheres as children for this ray. Talking of debugging. Interesting behavior, isn't it? This ray certainly won't help us. The reason for this is our model being a simple node. The character moves because the state's logic moves it, and the visuals move because they copy the pose of the skeleton, but not the position. But the model always stays in place, because, well, it doesn't know what the movement even is at the first place. There is no shame in moving from older implementations, so let's just change our model type to a node 3D. Midair update is trivial. The transition logic checks the distance to the floor and if critical height achieved transitions. Don't focus too much on the numbers for now. The landing logic is trivial as well. It waits, then transitions to the most important activity. The first cycle is done. Although, it has some quirks. Let's fix them with some custom blending. For now, just create a method for hardcoding a custom configuration of animations blend transitions. Play with it to achieve somewhat plausible results. But ultimately, the nicest transitions you could get are the transitions on the stage of assets creation. If you have an actual animator, tell them that your jump must start from one of the run frames and finish into run two. It will make your transition infinitely better than any blending. Speaking about having actual animators, look at my purposely awful sprint landing animations. A perfect illustration of an indie life, badly prepared stolen animations that start in the wrong place. If we will try to use it like that, there will be unwanted root bone teleportation leading to a leap in animation when midair transitions to a sprint landing, and then again when sprint landing transitions to idle. This unwanted root motion is actually a much worse problem than it seems. Let me create another debugging sphere on a level scene to follow the top level of player node. Now observe this behavior. The player appears to jump much higher than the actual player node thinks it jumps. The reason for this is our motion double dipping. Our model states move player by giving it an actual physical speed, but in addition to it, our skeleton is moving thanks to jumping up animation. That's a tough situation to work with, and I recommend to avoid it. Better choose a single approach. Either you simulate motion completely with the physics engine and making all your animations to be in place, or you simulate the movement completely hard-coded in animations and don't have physics simulation. Best choice is to mix and match. 
For example, the jump works nice with actual physics fallen with acceleration and all, plus with code it will be more customizable. On the other hand, many strike animations move player a little bit. This little step will be a pain in the ass to simulate with physics and also doesn't require heavy customization. For the strikes it's better to use the root motion approach. You can use the most imbalanced God of Shorke here to read a small guide on it. We are creating our jump with physics, so we are choosing to in-place our animations. We need to snap the root bone to a static position. To do this, boot your animations a little more. Delete all but one keys from the root position track, and the first key will be somewhat idle position not to teleport. Now do this for all three run jumps. Don't be afraid, you can always restore them from assets. See, as we cancelled unwanted skeleton impulse, our jump has much more adequate height. Repeat this root nailing process with sprint jumps. After the animations are fixed, it comes to me that sprinting jump cycle uses the exact same logic as run one, with different timings. Also, we will modify our midair to decide between landings based on horizontal speed. To give it a finishing touch, add more custom blending. To give it a truly thought out impression, add floor checks into running and sprinting states to transition into midair directly from movement if player runs into a gap. Looks pretty damn nice for two hours of working with some general third party animations. Too early to finish the video? Let's suddenly create a wall workflow for a 3D combat system. What can possibly go wrong? Well, I also don't want to speedrun the code, but to deliver those sweet sweet design decisions into your head. And to achieve that, we need to do some heavy lifting. Point 1. Player has much less primary inputs than their states in our model. For example, a single attack action invokes both plunging attacks and a light attack, depending on the situation. The action depends on the current weapon, so either the input reads model fields for contextual information, or we need to add another model layer between the input package emission and states code, some combat system. When designing a system from non-existence, you generally have two approaches. First one is to think what your new design is not. It is achieved by having strong design principles and opinions, for example, input does not read and or change model fields. Second one is to creatively think of what your design is. There are hints the universe leaves for you on the way. One of those is the language you use. Narrate your goals to your colleagues, to your cat or to your notebook. You can spot often used expressions, like combat system, weapon logic, moves combo. There is a pretty good chance that nice abstractions are hidden amongst those expressions. Combat system layer it is, my friends, but we aren't finished yet. Let's consult the holy sources for an inspiration. First observation, I make two strikes, but I press the button for the second strike during the first animation, and it queues. Same with the roll, I can queue the strike and it will actually combo into a roll strike. But can I queue a run? When roll is finished, my character is still facing forward and didn't turn left. This means that in case of Dark Souls 3, the running state is not equal to the strike state at least in one field. There are some usual non-queuing moves and there are some moves that can be queued, some combat moves. What if our input package had a special collection for those multipurpose inputs? These inputs must be further translated into a proper state machine move. It's starting to come together. Maybe our combat system is the layer that uses contextual information in the model and translates those combat inputs into all our moves. Well, if it does, that implements the transition logic, but we already have thin container with smart states and the states are responsible for transition logic as well. If we take a part of this work from them, the system starts to smell a bit. The idea of combat input translation is pretty good, but we need to make it thinner to comply with smart states architecture choice from earlier. Let's pause and think of other nouns we discovered for ourselves. Hmm. Weapon is an important abstraction. There is a single light attack button, but weapons map it to different attacks. If so, let's create a weapon and put there all the code that maps our input actions into basic moves. Now I see the path. Our very thin combat system takes combat actions, asks weapon to provide a translation and puts it into general actions array for smart moves to think further. Okay. Now, what about combos? Combo from combination is a set of an input and its context that together are turning into different input. Let's create a base combo class. All it has is a field for the combo result it invokes and a function that decides if the combo is triggered. Our input is a package, so function takes it as an argument. Now, as our combo needs also a context and our states need an access to combo logic to transition, it comes to that combos are tightly composed with states. What if we literally parent the combo to the moves? 
to rewind. Stateless input creates an input package, then combat system translates this input into basic moves with the help of the current weapon. Then if our move can invoke combos, in its transition logic it asks its combos if they are triggered. If they are, they store the triggered action into a cute move field. Then the states can use state cute move field in further transitions without the fear that it would be lost in time. And of course, check combos is a base move functional. This way we can add new combos code into pre-existed states without warping their logic too much. This combo system is nicely put into an input bus traveling, but also is weakly coupled enough to allow custom scripting in the combo invoking logic. These are very good signs. Even though in case of a source like the combos we will face are very simple, this system is scalable enough to create complex and branching strike series. Sometimes my genius is it's almost frightening. Let's finally use our creation. I downloaded and butchered 3 strikes combo. It will take 3 actions. To map our slashes we also need a weapon here. I called mine sword. For now our sword has a single light attack that's first hit in the series is a slash 1. As always, we are stripping the model from visuals. Create a sword model scene and only attach it to the disabled collider and the debug handle to align it with our character hands. To give our character the sword we need a socket for it on our wrist. Happy little sword. If you use different animations and aren't happy enough with the weapon movement, don't be ashamed to create a track for the attachment and rotation. Now we need a skin for it. You can use a proper model, I didn't sweat too much and just slapped here a metallic material as a joke. To snap weapon visuals to weapon model, create a small function in the visual script. Quick review of slash states. The animation has no root motion, so no update functions. Transition logic utilizes combos. Slash 1 has a combo that turns consecutive slash 1 into a slash 2 cute move. And there is a small dead window to differentiate between conscious consecutive inputs and a panic and double click. Similar to this, slash 2 turns into a slash 3. Also, notice that combo and timing is not equal to transition drop timing. Ideally, you need animations to overlap, so if player didn't queue second hit, the first hit animation has long tail transition into idle. If second hit is inputted, we can transition to it faster. This little touch adds depth to our combat system, as there are small window in the slashes that a player can time consecutive attacks differently. I would say, not bad for below our tutorial. But let's work as our own critics for a second. The approach of nesting unique nodes is nice when we are channeling and branching consecutive hits, but what about universal statuses? How about reactions targeted animation that can be invoked from literally every animation in the game? And roll move being comboed into a roll attack with all weapons in the game hundreds of times? Hundred copied scripts with different constants and animations? Well, yes, we sold our soul for scalability and we have a scriptable combo behavior right here. Combo can even have dynamic cute move. You can nest a roll attack combo into a roll move and change the cute move into an assigned attack in the input. That's one combo to many moves. What about stagger? Many moves to one combo that has a very similar behavior, but with different timing windows. Do we copy paste it? Yes we do. Godo has a specific term for a node plus script package with manageable constants. It called a scene. Stagger is a combo that will be nested to its moves in the form of a scene. This scene has the same scripts trigger, but has different timing windows that you can even export and edit them directly here in the editor. In fact, if you'd think, look at these terrible namings, slash 1 to slash 2. Did you really thought a person like me would tolerate these names for long? These scripts are identical with minor differences. All they do is they channel next consecutive attack. Combos are scenes. And the consecutive attacks of all attack lines are being managed with a consecutive attack combo. Right now our attack moves are unique and are a walk of love. In the future our moves will be stinified too to enable mass production of them. But look at this giant node 3, wouldn't it harm us? I probably give away with the vibe of clean code evangelical, but I am actually a fan of good enough school. It's really important to not create a system with clean code and terrible performance. Let's inspect it. I'd say our frame processing times aren't different enough to distinguish them from basic character 3D script working. My only fault is this memory leak that sneaked into our main cycle. The reason is we are emitting our input packages every frame and don't delete them properly afterwards. Fixed. This system is perfectly capable of being a AAA controller if had right assets while having no significant cost on performance. The only thing we are missing are character resources and combat state flags for interaction between different characters. But those systems can be easily built on top of our smart state's timings. 
was it that hard to build this? Hobby engine for 2D games, my ass. And finally, the moment that triggers my bit. For some fucking reason, how to build first person controller and how to build third person controller are two different search queries. Build a proper controller, please, then slap there any camera you want. It took me exactly two strings of code to incorporate a shitty third person camera into this character. And if you want a mega ultra sexy third person camera, you can check my Souls like camera tutorials.